Oh, well, thank you very much, Joseph, for this very kind invitation. Uh, it's a great honour to be here, and uh, I thank you for your kind words. Uh, I've known Joseph since about 2002 or two, uh, in the Australian Conference in Melbourne, and um, I've learnt a lot from him. And uh, I think we complement each other in some ways because uh, I have been fortunate enough to have access to high-tech equipment, uh, a lot of uh, electron microscopy, uh, state-of-the-art synchrotron and high-tech equipment. So we spent a lot of time just uh, understanding geopolymers from the basic science, material science point of view. But, but um, Joseph has a lot of insight and intuition and most of the time he's right. Usually we find it 10 or 20 years later that he was right, you know. So uh, I'm very glad to be here because uh, there's a lot to learn and I think you're fortunate to be here too. <laughs> so um, so uh, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, the geopolymer route to high-tech ceramics. And uh, this work has been supported over the last 18, 20 years by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Dow Chemical Fund uh, Company, uh, the Army Research Office uh, in Aberdeen, and uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers more recently. Uh, they have a construction engineering research lab in Champaign, Illinois, and they're quite interested in applications. Uh, so. <clears throat> and over the years, there's been generations of masters, PhDs and postdocs that have contributed to this geopolymer work. And uh, today's talk, I've only got, um, you know, 30 minutes, so I'll get to the point. Um, I, I would like to uh, talk about composition and starting materials, microstructure, processing routes to ceramics, especially oxides and non-oxides. And uh, I've recently had been asked to write a review paper for um, th this set of books uh, published at Oxford about compressive composite, uh, comprehensive composite materials too. Uh, and this is uh, a contribution to volume five of those books. So uh, yes, I'll, you already know this, but when I give this talk, it's always uh, Joseph Davidovitz that introduced the term geopolymer. When I first started, I was confused because oh, I ended up going to Kiev to visiting um, Pavel Krivenko and, and Viktor Glukovsky's lab in Kiev. And I always couldn't understand. Are they talking about geopolymers? Uh, Joseph's talking about geopolymers. Who invented it first? And after a lot of confusion, I've decided that, that Joseph invented it first, and the Kiev people are, in, you know, talk, are really talking about alkali-activated cements. Um, so for us, over the years, this is what ge a geopolymer means to us. The chemical word is polysilicate aluminate, polysilates. They're a type of chemically bonded ceramics of the formula one group, one oxide, one alumina, four silica and 11 water. Uh, that 11 water is just an arbitrary number. It depends on the specific surface area and particle size of the powders. Uh, we, we use bas f um, but I'm learning there's a whole bunch more uh, even uh, varied sources of metacalin. Uh, it produces a refractory, you know, they're refractory in organic polymers formed from aluminum silicon tetrahedra under highly caustic conditions. They are a rigid, hydrated, aluminosilicate solid containing group one charge balancing cations. They result in an amorphous nanoparticulate, nanoporous impervious acid resistant polymeric structure. And there's metastable zeolites. That's uh, in the case of sodium-based geopolymer. It's a metastable zeolite, or maybe sodalite. I learnt a lot of my stuff from Ken McKenzie in New Zealand, and um, we sort of cross-fertilised each other. And and then you know I'm getting more and more knowledge by hanging around with Joseph and his team. 
Um, so the way I see it, as a physical and inorganic chemist, if you have five molecules of silica, the oxidation state's plus four. If you take away one mole, you get back with um, four moles of silica plus four, and you replace that silica with one mole of alumina, that's plus three. So you need another plus one to make plus four to get back to here. So this is a group one oxide, uh, sodium, potassium, lithium, cesium, rubidium, franconium, or, uh, and the water uh, to just for the rheology. You need water. Um, the, so the way to make it uh, as a material science model system to keep it simple is um, get clay. <laughs> clay, and uh, when you heat clay, um, it'll become metacaline, uh, and um, it'll be one, like a ceramic engineer writes, that's what I teach at Illinois, one mole of alumina and two moles of silica, and the water's gone, you know, if you heat it to 750C for one hour. But the other ingredients come as you take, uh, say, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, cesium hydroxide, and you dissolve in two moles of amorphous silica. And that could be from, uh, you, you know, uh, various silica, uh, cabosil in Illinois, we got Tuscola, cabosil or ground up glass, so long as it's amorphous silica, it can't attack anything that's crystalline, it's not strong enough. And um, so that makes a solution, and that's water glass or sodium metasilicate, and that's the clay. Now, yes, the big long-winded confusion about alkali-activated cements, it's even more clear to me now after Joseph's talk this morning. This is the ternary phase diagram, silica, uh, group 1 oxide and alumina. 114, the reason we say 114 is because I, uh, 20 some years, oh no, 18 years ago, um, I realised people didn't really know what they were talking about in terms of what is a geopolymer, so I put it in the TEM and I did EDS, chemistry on it. And I always found that the characteristic microstructure had a characteristic chemistry, 114, one alumina, <clears throat> one uh, group one oxide and four silica. And that's this. So that's what I call a geopolymer. It's a stoichiometric geopolymer. And that's because that's what I see in the T TEM all the time. Uh, it, it, not the overall mixture I started with, but t geopolymer's got a characteristic microstructure. Then I was on PhD exams in civil engineering and they were supposed to be doing geopolymers and I sit there halfway through the exam, all right, when are you going to start talking about geopolymers? And the civil engineers think they're talking about geopolymers but they're really talking about things over here uh, and they're selling themselves short in terms of the mechanical properties. Cash and Nash, no, well, even you shouldn't be saying Cash and Nash anymore. But that stuff is definitely not geopolymers, you know. So we, anyway, so geopolymers are a potential partial solution to global warming. One tonne of Portland cement liberates one tonne of CO2, but to make one tonne of geopolymerase, you only liberate about a quarter of a tonne of CO2. And the mechanical properties between ordinary Portland cement and geopolymer composites are uh, Geopolymer is roughly twice the strength of uh, cements in compression, three times the strength in uh, flexure, half the density, and set to full uh, in one day. So it's the synthesis. So it's a different uh, list over the years. Uh, it started maybe with Victor Glukowski and Slag in the USA, uh, USSR making the alkali activated cements. A lot of fly ash from coal plants in Australia. Uh, Joseph, 18 years ago, gave me the tip of starting with the clays. But in New Zealand, Ken McKenzie uses Halloy site. And then uh, I, I've talked to various people. Um, it, you could also use the black glass from plasma incinerated you know, rubbish. Every, every week somebody comes and takes your rubbish away and burns it and then uh, that leaves a black class and you can make geopolymer out of that as a silicate source. Recycled glass, colour it, grind it up. A basalt from organic tufts 
can be made into ge on Hawaii, all those volcanoes, on the on Mars. There's a lot of basalt. So uh, NASA's, you know, realizes this. And meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of biological materials: rice husks, bamboo leaves, elephant grass, 50% silica, 80 to 90% silica by calcining these products. So. Uh, Oh, the army's interested for using indigenous materials. Wherever you are, use what you got. Don't waste for it to come in the, in the mail. Um, so, uh, okay, so this is my version, uh, what um, Joseph told me 18 years ago. Kal uh, kaolinite is crystalline and the aluminum's in six-fold coordination. When you make it amorphous by heating, it goes into five-fold coordination. And uh, this is a highly strained molecule. How come that you can make a ceramic material which usually you have to fire it to 1,000, 1,200, 1,300, uh, a long time, long energy, and here just water can, and can make a ceramic material? It's because when it's amorphous, uh, the concentrated NaOH or KOH can attack this molecule. And it's so strained, strained in this fivefold coordination that it is attackable and, and it can be broken up into the tetrahedra, ALO4 minus, and away she goes. So that's a critical step. Uh, Terry Trigg, uh, Australia, um, CSIRO, Melbourne, the rate determining step is the dissolution of the aluminosilicate source. Uh, and this is it. And so crystalline aluminosilicates are no good for making geopolymers. It's got to be the strain molecule. And the same principle might apply for other chemistries, you know, the phosphates. Um, so anyway, you get a, a powder and a liquid, a high shear it, that's the other trick. The first year, we, we used a milkshake mixer with a little propeller. And uh, you know we had a lot of unreacted phase, only 50% reacted. And then um, w with a high shear mixing paddle with teeth up, teeth down, teeth up, teeth down. And we used this. A and um, that makes um, uh, the rheology good. First, you get the powder and the liquid and you get texture of toothpaste, toothpaste. But when you put it in a high shear mixer, it, it becomes low viscosity like honey in summer, runny honey. So that's the trick. You, as soon as the, um, you attack the metacalin, you have to clean off what you've formed so keep the reaction going. You need the high shear mixer. Oh, and then you put it into a mold and it doesn't stick to plastics. And, and then uh, if you wanted to, you could heat it to 50 C and you'll get it uh, in 12 hours. Um, but uh, I, I don't know the property is quite as good as the room temperature. You can put nice colours in like this and you can have a nice mold. And there's always, a, the water tries to get out so that it makes a film at the interface and you can demold it not, uh, readily. This is from uh, one of uh, uh, since 18 years now, I've been organising the international focus session on geopolymers at, date, at uh, part of the American Ceramic Society. I try to make a home for geopolymers in ceramics and they let me do it. And um, now they want to make it a symposium, so next year it's going to be a symposium. But uh, th th this was Ho Chi Minh City, PhD student from North, uh, North Vietnam came, and you can put beautiful colours in and you can make a souvenir. You know, it looks like bronze, but it's not. So, microstructure. All right, now we all know it's SiO4 and ALO4 tetrahedra. More practically in the lab, uh, when you make a, a metacaolin, you get an amorphous hump at 22 degrees 2 theta. When you make geopolymer, it migrates to 28 degrees 2 theta, 30 degrees. Uh, you might have um, impurities. This is bas F with some titanium impurities. But um, if they're crystalline, the geopolymer can't touch it. 
Um, and now this Ken McKenzie current version of what the atomic structure is, SiO4 tetrahedra, ALO4 minus tetrahedra, like a glass, but it's never been fired. But ALO4 minus needs a charge balancing cation to hang around. And um, th that charge balancing cation is surrounded by water of solvation. So this is the current uh, material science accepted version of what a geopolymer is. And um, in, the, in the SEM, it's nanoparticulate and nanoporous. So they look like cauliflower to me, you know, a pretty weird structure. I mean, I teach TEM. I never saw such a crazy structure. And then in the TEM, uh, well, if you, um, you, you just make it by crushing it and dispersing it on a grid, you get little nanoprecipitates little precipitates like plant cakes that fall out. And, and if you use sodium or potassium or cesium, they got texture, a little black and white, black and white, you know, I don't know, but it's beyond the limit of TEM by now. And, and there's texture inside of texture inside of texture. And this is sodium, potassium, cesium. Maybe sodium's like 20, 30 nanometers, 30, you know, 30, 40, uh, 40 nanometer splats, these little splats and precipitates that stick to each other. And then a high angle annular dark field, uh, it's nano precipitates. You can see those little pancakes just sitting on top of each other, but it makes a tight, coherent structure. And then if you send it out for uh, um, pore size analysis and porosity measurements, so by porotech, the, uh, with potassium, the average pore radius is 3.4 nanometers, and, but it's 41% porosity by volume. Uh, and, uh, and potassium is pretty homogeneous porosity. Sodium is a bit heterogeneous. The mechanical properties of potassium better than sodium. Uh, if you make geopolymer by a synthetic method, which is organic steric entrapment that we have a patent on in the US, you can get uh, average pore size 0.8 nanometers uh, or, uh, radius, which is 1.6 nanometers diameter. So 6.8 nanometers diameter porosity, 41%. And uh, now porosity in geopolymers, right, people might be interested in using that for something. So if we uh, add peroxide to it, you can get 45% pores in there. Um, uh, Don Sayo at Arizona State um, in, in, uh, invented and got a patent on putting in cooking oil, canola cooking oil, and uh, produce, with sodium saponification, soap making, and it can make hundreds of microns pore sizes. And then he just washes the, the, the soap out and um, it leaves a porous geopolymer. Uh, other people have put in bentonite or kitty litter. That makes porosity like bread. Um, we did a PhD with support from Dow Chemical. They wanted zero gels or aerogels. So we uh, worked with uh, uh, alkoxy silanes and um, we could make 75% volume porosity, one micron pore size. Um, you could also just put in lots of water, but that's it's just uh, like a porous material. It's got low strength. Uh, he, here is the, uh, the al um, this is what we did with the Dow chemical, the silane. So um, you can have one micron pore size and 75% porosity. That's published. So, well, meanwhile, moving on to the structure, we, we see it's black and white, black and white in the TEM, and then we reach the limit of high resolution TEM. So we switch to um, uh, radial distribution function in glass, or in the synchrotron work, it's pair distribution function, PDF. And that means you have one atom and, and it measures the distances to all the other atoms in the material and what types of distances are there. Uh, it's an amorphous technique and, and um, 
Uh, so uh, basically, you get a, 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 this is the ra distance between the other atoms, like a histogram of characteristic distances with all the other atoms, and, and you get this function in real space, which you um, uh, you get a fun and then uh, you, you, it makes a histogram, and, and basically it um, it says that even at room temperature, you've got characteristic units of tetrahedra, um, uh, ALO4 minus an SAO4 tetrahedra. And uh, in the case of cesium uh, as a charge balancing cation, you get it out to about seven nanometers, or no, seven angstroms, and you've got these tetrahedra building blocks already in place, but they have no long range order. Uh, so you've you got uh, polymers, but there's snakes in a box going everywhere, and you want them. If you want to crystallize them, they're all supposed to lie down uh, uh, straight. So if you want to crystallize like this material, which is called polysite, you have to heat to a thousand C. So this ge real geopolymer is stable to a, you know a thousand, and then the worst thing it can do is crystallize, you know, and then polysite melts at 1940C. So that's, um, that might be useful like for radioactive cleanups. Um, now if you take that PDF function and, and you submit, I mean subtract the room temperature from the higher temperatures, there's no difference um, in the types of units, the SiO4 tetrahedra, the ALO4 minus tetrahedra. The only difference is around about 1,000 uh, it crystallizes. Um, the other thing is this uh, sodalite, zeolite formation. It's a metastable zeolite. That's what the Australians told me. If you give it a lot of water, then, then the molecules can swim around and start making nice crystals. But if you don't, you didn't give it enough water, then it makes a geopolymer structure. And um, also, the chemistry has to be right. Only sodium can make zeolites, that it's one, one, two, you know, one soda, one alumina, two silica. Then you make zeolite, you could, little nanocrystallites, but if it's a three silica or four silica, you don't make zeolites. So only in the case of one, one, two composition for sodium can you make zeolites. And, um, oh, so here's a picture of the zeolite. Um, if you add more water, it doesn't change the atomic structure, but it changes the microstructure, makes it more porous. Now, oh, this is a bit of a problem. If you're in structural ceramics, you want to make some useful structure out of it. Um, well, it's good at room temperature, so long as you keep it at room temperature. But if you heat it, then the water's going to come out. And um, around about 400, it could do a lot of damage because of the nanoporosity. Uh, th there's a thing called oh, uh, the Young and Laplace equation, um, which says uh, delta P equals 2 cos theta over R. R is in the bottom. R is 10 to the minus 9. So that means R is 10, to, the delta P is plus 10 to the minus 9. So you've got huge forces in a nano tunnel. And that water going in or water going out is going to crack it. You take a pure geopolymer made as nice as you can with metacalin and the works, you get a bowl of water, you put the geopolymer in, and it goes snap, crackle, pop, like Kellogg's cornflakes. Uh, that's all the water going in or the water coming out. So reality week is you've got to make composite. You've got to put in some reinforcements to hold it together. Don't let it break during the dehydration. Uh, okay, so um, so this dehydration and in, in, in chunks of it will crack it. And so therefore we embarked on a whole bunch of adding reinforcements and what sort of microstructure and what sort of mechanical properties do you get. So you can add particulate reinforcements like a chamot, which is a calcined clay to produce mullite particles plus silica. Oh, that's the mullite particulates, granite, dolomite, sand, whatever. 
You can put it, that's, part, that's particles, like zero dimensional defects. Chopped fibres, alumina fibres, basalt fibres, carbon fibres, alumina platelets from grinding media, uh, fabrics, you know, uh, uh, and there's, there's long fibres, and then fabrics, uh, carbon fibre, uh, NASA, Nextel 610 alumina 720. <coughs> Basalt weaves, this, basalt fibres uh, from techno basalt in, um, in um, Kiev and also uh, Kameny Vec, Moscow, uh, they produce good basalt fibres, 1200C capability, uh, and these can be used as a cheap but pretty good reinforcement compared with the expensive 3M Nextel fibres. Uh, got some mullite single crystal fibers from Moscow with love. And um, then, well, since you make geopolymer at room temperature, you can uh, put in polymeric fibers because they, they can't take the heat, and then a whole bunch of biological fibers. Uh, just a quick li little look at it. Here's alumina platelets, uh, micro grit is a company that sells alumina platelets, roughly 50 microns in diameter. Uh, you, you throw them into, this was potassium geopolymer, and you get 30 or 50 or 70. Usually you can only get about 15 weight percent, but if you vibrate the hell out of it, um, you can get uh, up to 50 weight percent, which is 70, uh, 70 weight percent, which is 50 volume percent. And then you make that composite and you heat it, 300, 600, 900, 1200, and, and you measure the mechanical properties, uh, the strength is pretty good. S -s 20 megapascals up to 1200 degrees C, and um, high strength concrete is 7 megapascals down here somewhere. So that might be useful for something. If you break this uh, uh, at room temperature, you get this roughly 20. But if you break it in situ by in the instron at high temperature, you can get 40 megapascals up to 1200 degrees C, uh, which is a good high temperature composite, you know, um, and it doesn't cost much. Um, here you can throw in basalt chopped fibers, uh, a quarter inch or a half inch. You can get uh, 17 megapascals or 27 megapascals just with 10 weight percent basalt chopped fibers. Oh, this was a vertical liftoff runway, the Air Force at, uh, T at Tyndall Air Force Base uh, north of Cuba uh, wanted, now the aeroplanes don't just run off, like that. they take off like a rocket and then they go somewhere, that's called a vertical liftoff and when they take off they burn the cement and uh, little rocks hit the aeroplane and Edwards Air Force Base in California, as soon as one of them take off, you have to go out and vacuum the, air, uh, the, the thing to clean up the little rocks. Well, when you put, uh, this was cesium, uh, and nothing happens to 15, well, here, a bit of water, come, um, a glassy phase comes out, but 1500C, five minutes with oxyacetylene torch, nothing happens. Uh, part of that was because uh, the thermal expansion of cesium is approximately zero. Um, so here's just a bit of a summary. Um, those particulates, uh, the chop fibres and, and, and the weaves. The weaves have the best mechanical properties. The tensile strength. The best thing NASA uses now is Nextel 610 monazite. Uh, a coated alumina fibres and their tensile strength 117 at about 10 times the price. But if you use uh, a Nextel 610 plus geopolymer, um, then you can get just as good, if not better. And if you use cheapo basalt, then, then it's, uh, well, it depends on the basalt. Uh, but the, the flexural strength with basalt is quite respectable. 41 megapascals compared to 40 for mullite and 50 for alumina. So, now this talk is supposed to be about uh, processing, uh, all about geopolymers and high temperature materials. So, two ways to do that. One is make composites that go to high temperature, like I just talked to you about. The other one is use geopolymers as a processing route, an alternative way to make ceramics. 
Uh, and um, well, uh, the phase diagram: sodium, aluminosilicate, uh, and the one one that's uh, that's weight percent. This is mole percent, I think. The one one four compound is here. That's the geopolymer composition. But to make sodium into a ceramic, you you don't get one one four. You get one one two. That's called nephthalene. 114 is jade, the toughest mineral, but you need geological pressures, 1.7 gigapascals, 1250 C to make jade. But that means that's a synthetic way to make jade, you know, if you've got some friends in the geology department. Uh, to, to make uh, lucite, uh, uh, the 114 with potassium is lucite. And that's uh, it's got ah, intermediate thermal expansion used in the dental industry. Um, the thermal expansion of sodium uh, nephthalene is 50 by 10 to the minus 6. Potassium is 20, uh, what is it, 15 to 31 by 10 to the minus 6. And cesium is around about 0.45 to 1 by 10 to the minus 6. Cesium produces lucite at, uh, at 1100 C. Lucite is very creep resistant. There's YAG, mullite, lucite, hexacelsian. It's very creep resistant and uh, it melts about 1940 C. So uh, that's good to know. Um, so thermal expansions, uh, sodium GP 50 by 10 to the minus 6, Ah, that's big long silica chains flop around a tiny little sodium atom. The chains can do what they like, so they stretch 50 by 10 to the minus 6. Potassium is a bigger um, cation, so the chains can flop around to some extent, but uh, their thermal expansion is only 26, 28. Cesium is a big fat cation. The sodiums are trying really hard to, to, to get around it. So there's a very little thermal expansion, 0.45 by 10 to the minus 6. So now, if you start, you can start tailoring the thermal expansion, make a geopolymer coating on a metal, figure out what the metal thermal expansion is, whip up a mixture with a similar thermal expansion, and they'll all expand together, see? So, uh, yeah, we're working on that too. It works. So um, now that's like heating a ceramic to make a, uh, heating a geopolymer to make a ceramic. Here is heating a geopolymer to make a ceramic powder. And uh, this is called carbothermal reduction and carbothermal nitridization. And it's a way to make ceramics cheaper. So I teach ceramics, how to make silicon carbide, you Aitchison process. You go down to the Borden's ear and you get a, a hydroelectric power that costs a fortune and you get silica and coke and grind and grind and grind and then you heat for 2,500 degrees C for days and you make silicon carbide and then you grind and grind and grind and grind and get some silicon carbide to silt. That's a lot of energy, a lot of energy, a lot of energy. Meanwhile, the trick is geopolymer makes nanoparticulars, right? Well, go with the flow. Uh, if you have a nanoparticle, the diffusion distance is very short, small. So you get some geopolymers and you grind it. It's not as hard as silicon carbide. And then you put it in flowing argon or nitrogen. Um, at, at, at four, we did 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, and, uh, as, and um, one or two hours, and you get nano, silicon carbide, silicon nitride, or sialon. These are high-tech ceramics. Uh, uh, and so the, the reason you can do that is these little nano precipitates, so diffusion distance is short, when you heat a ceramic, a geopolymer, it'll convert to a ceramic at a crystalline material at a thousand. Even though its microstructure is still nano, uh, so can we use uh, these techniques already established in mineral uh, minerals processing? Carbo, uh, carb. Can we convert a geopolymer to its carbide and nitride analogs by carbothermal reduction? 
Use carbon for reduction, use heat for diffusion, and if it's flowing, the aluminum is, uh, melts to 600, it goes away with the gas, uh, the CO2, uh, some CO2 goes, um, and, and what's left is the refractory part. So this study investigated silicon carbide. If you want to do nitridization, instead of argon gas, it's nitrogen gas. And, and what, what you do is uh, you get metacalin and you mix it with carbon. You can use sodium, potassium, or cesium. We did the whole systematic sweep. So first you make the geopolymer, then you grind it up and mix it with carbon. Yeah, make it, but you could, uh, well, what, this worked. And you mix it with carbon, and then you do 14, 15, 1600 under argon or under nitrogen and analyze it. If it's argon, then it's carbother carbothermal reduction. If it's under nitrogen, it's carbothermal reduction and nitridization. That means nitrides formed. And, and uh, the, his whole, yeah, you know, do x-rays and reed felt, and um, you, reed felt tells you how much of each phase you got, you know, 80% of this, 20% of that. So 1400C, you get um, alumina and silicon carbide. 1500C, more silicon carbide, just little alumina. 1600C, silicon carbide, you know, about 97%. Uh, <clears throat> now, if you wanted to make an alumina silicon carbide composites, you'd take this and hot press it, you know. But, uh, but uh, it, here, you can make just about a, a pure silicon carbide, just at this low temperature. And the SCM shows that it's nano soft agglomerates. Um, that's sodium. Um, in the TEM, it looks like nanoparticles and sometimes needles, whiskers, silicon carbide nanoparticles. So we did a lot of lot of TEM, and um, basically this sort of summarizes that this little part of it. If you take silicon uh, um, 14, 15, 1600 with sodium GP, potassium GP, or cesium GP. Uh, and uh, for two hours, you could get like 97% uh, of silicon carbide, or you could get a mixture, silicon carbide alumina. Or if you use potassium GP, you get 100% alumina, that expensive way to make alumina. But, but it's just an academic, good to know. Next thing is treat it with nitrogen. This is the carbothermal nitridization. So uh, here, if you um, take uh, nitrogen with sodium geopolymer, ground it up, add carbon, 18 moles of carbon, excess carbon, to produce the reducing atmosphere. Heat it between 14 and 1600 C, uh, as 14, or 14, 15, 16, in nitrogen, then you'll get alpha silicon nitride and beta silicon nitride, some alumina and some aluminum nitride. So you get mostly alpha and beta, 1500 alpha and beta, uh, 1600 uh, more beta and less alpha. And so there's the SEM. The, uh, the, the beta are the needles. Uh, we deliberately put in beta silicon nitride into alpha silicon nitride as a crack deflection toughening mechanism, but but this has got 50/50, so it's even more useful. And and here's more rigorous detailed TEM to prove that you know alpha and beta. Um, this is uh, potassium, similar results, um, and TEM says yeah you make. Uh, Alpha silicon nitride and beta silicon nitride, and more detailed TEM to prove it. So this is a, a bit of a summary here about um, you add carbon, but you do it in nitrogen. Here's the nitrogen, and you add carbon. You do 14, 15, 16 with sodium, 14, 15, 16 with potassium, 14, 15, 16 with cesium for two hours. And um, so it, here you'd form, uh, this says you'd form alpha silicon nitride and beta less, uh, and a bit of aluminum nitride. 
Um, uh, here with potassium, you always make the predominant phase is uh, beta silicon nitride. And here with cesium, you'd make uh, alpha silicon nitride. Uh, so that's good to know. Um, then, then the other one is if you don't add so much carbon, just nine moles of carbon, then um, you don't take away all the oxygen. Carbon plus oxygen equals CO2. Just put nine moles, and then you start forming sialons, which is a pretty good uh, high temperature structural ceramic. Uh, it's already nano for you. You don't have to grind it. You just have to make it flow out, uh, you know, flow the uh, air, the, the gas over it, and then collect it. Um, so uh, if you uh, soil on even 1400C with sodium, cheap, 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 you'd just form soil on there. Or 1500C, soil on. Or 1600C, soil on and some alumina. Uh, so, so these are ready-made composites. All you've got to do is uh, press them and fire them, you know. Uh, and, and so they're already little, you know, 10 microns or, um, no, uh, they're soft agglomerates by now, um, or, or even hard agglomerates if you do it for a long time, but they're still less than 10 microns. Um, so, so here the Cylons, you can always make a lot of Cylons at uh, 1500C that all make Cylons. So, in conclusion, yeah. this is the part where you wake up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the uh, carbothermal reduction or nitrization of geopolymers, higher levels, over 95% of silicon carbide was synthesized from sodium precursor using 18 moles of carbon, plenty of excess carbon to take away the oxygen. Carbothermal reduction, uh, silicon carbide, alpha and beta silicon nitride and Cylon ceramics could be cost effectively synthesized from geopolymer precursors. Uh, sodium geopolymer have an advantage over potassium and cesium uh, in its low cost. Um, by focusing on the sodium and potassium, you can get useful structural ceramic and ceramic powders to make components by an inexpensive geopolymer route. And so, summary, what we talked about, what are geopolymer starting materials, microstructure, nanoporous, nanoparticulate. You can make tailorable thermal expansion oxides. You can make non-oxides. Um, there's a bunch of potential applications. And there's these two, every year, uh, this next year is the 18th annual announced symposium on geopolymers. And it is produced in a conference proceedings. So uh, there are 17 uh, books published by the American Ceramic Society. And any papers coming here are also very welcome. And uh, also there'll be uh, the ECI, Engineering Conference International in Portugal next year is starting up. Uh, that's got a mixed community, uh, alkali activated materials and geopons, but we're st uh, still trying to get them to wash out their mouth when they use the geopons the wrong way. So thank you very much.